Let me get at it because I want to make sure we got plenty of time for questions. Let me also again uh, uh, say that uh, uh, the fact that you all turned out, so many of you, uh, nobody's getting extra credit for this, are they? <laughs> this was choice. Uh, but um, because I can tell you, not all of our elected officials have the same passion. Uh, I remember during the debacle in August of 2011 uh, with the debt ceiling crisis, uh, the, well, the first of our four times that we in Congress have muffed this and missed, uh, messed this up, um, I had gotten so kind of spun up on it that when other senators would see me walking down the hall, they would try to go the other direction rather than have me, me grab them and, um, and kind of say, hey, we got to fix this. Um, let me give you the, uh, the preface. I, you know, again, I was a business guy when I was governor. Virginia had an a, um, uh, unsustainable bu budget, a, a structural budget deficit. We were able to turn that around and not only gain the recognition that President Sullivan mentioned about you know, being business friendly and well managed, but also make the largest investment in uh, public education and higher education in Virginia history, uh, which uh, at the end of the day is a part of the debt and deficit as well, because as much as we try to cut and tax, we cannot simply cut and tax our way out of this problem. We also have to have a growth agenda as well. And uh, part of that growth agenda will be uh, uh, getting this plan in place. Let me set the, set the stage on this. Let's first of all say, uh, you know, uh, before we go to slide one, let me acknowledge that this problem of debt and deficit, while it has been, you know, obviously much more in the news in the last, you know, three or four years, five years since the fiscal crisis, is not new. Um, in many ways, President Reagan raised this issue. Uh, President Clinton dealt with it uh, in the early 90s. Um, and the truth of the matter is, over the last 75 years, America, on an annual basis, has run a deficit. You know, all these combined deficits add into the total national debt, which is now $16.5 trillion. But we have run an annual deficit of those past 75 years about 70 of the 75 years. So the idea that this problem is suddenly new, or it must be just the Republicans' problem, or that it's a Democrats' problem, baloney. Both sides have got uh, blame on their hands. And you know, an annual deficit on a, a, in a targeted, thoughtful way, in many ways, is good fiscal policy. We see right now countries in, in Europe, Greece and others, who, because they don't have control over their own financial system and their own monetary system, you know, don't have the flexibility to use, you know, targeted deficit running uh, during periods of economic decline. But those using debt and deficit in a rational way is very different than where we are in America right now with $16.5 trillion. First slide, please. Yeah, I got my little doodad here. All right, good. Now, here is the question of, you know, where our debt have gone. Obviously, uh, we see the debt went up greatly during World War II. The number to remember right here is uh, there have been economists that have done studies of debt to GDP this amount of our total debt to the total size of our economy uh, over countries all over the world over the last 100 years. The rule of thumb here, if you take nothing away at all from this chart, is that once a country hits about 90% of debt to GDP, you're kind of in the period of no return. So what we've seen is America went up during this period of World War II, came down dramatically, and then are rising on a level that's unsustainable. So uh, this problem, while lots of causation, we're going to come to this in a moment, is one that gets exponentially worse. And I'm sure in the Up to Us campaign it has been brought home to you. But guess what? If we don't fix it, guess who pays the debt? You guys. Matter of fact, it used to be when you would do this pitch, you'd say, you know, if we don't get this done, you know, it's going to hurt our grandchildren. Then it got worse. If we don't get this done, it's going to hurt our kids. We don't get this done. Even people, me and Connie Kinchlow's age, it's going to, you know, make our retirements impossible. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. All right. Technology help for the uh, cell phone guide. And, you know, here's one of these other. Here's one of these other points that just, you know, right now our debt is bad. But one of the reasons why we are not bankrupt already is 
because it's all right, I heard that cell phone go off. I was the co-founder of Nextel, doesn't bother me at all if cell phones go off when I'm talking. <laughs> you heard this line before, you hear an annoying sound, I hear cha-ching, cha-ching, so just to, uh, <laughs> How many times you heard that? Um, but here, 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 this will give you the thing. Think about the amount that we pay each year just in interest costs. Right now, if interest costs were at their historic levels, you know, seven, eight percent, six, seven percent, as opposed to three percent, two percent, virtually nothing, these numbers would be doubling. So, you know, literally, billions and billions of dollars spent out each year simply on interest. Next slide. Or am I pointing? Okay. One of the things people say was, all right, well, I remember, if you follow this stuff at all, I remember into Clinton, you know, we had a surplus. How did we get so bad in the last 13 years? Well, it's actually pretty easy uh, to explain on a plain business proposition. And all the numbers I'm going to use, uh, just let me, again, uh, again, with a crowd like you who are interested, I'm going to give you more details than you want. But the way Congress measures everything, whether you're cutting taxes, raising taxes, cutting spending, increasing spending, you don't measure it on one-year windows. You measure it on a 10-year window. The referee on determining how much things cost or save or whatever is the Congressional Budget Office. So CBO, 10-year windows. So the numbers I'm mostly going to give you are 10-year numbers. So how did we go from the end of Clinton with a surplus to this problem right now that seems to dominate the news and where we're at the teetering on the edge of fiscal, um, um, uh, fiscal demise? It's actually a pretty easy business proposition. Um, we cut taxes by four and a half trillion dollars over 10 years. That was the biggest tax cut in American history. And we could have actually, and this is the part the Democrats sometimes don't want to acknowledge, we could have actually probably gotten away with that tax cut of that size if these other, we hadn't on the spending side done these other five items. So what did we do? And again, these were all items that were done, including the Bush tax cuts, let me add, were all done in a bipartisan way. So the idea that this was one side or the other getting the blame isn't the case. Well, first of all, after 9-11, with that horrible attack, we doubled baseline defense spending. Much of that was needed. Some of it now is not sustainable. Next thing we did, we went to war not once, but twice. And this part was unprecedented. We went to war not once, not twice, 100% on the credit card. Not a dollar of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan was paid for. You know, I grew up in the, in the 60s and 70s. You know, was not a keen fan of President Nixon or, or the Vietnam War. But at least President Nixon put an income tax surcharge in place to try to help pay for the Vietnam War. We basically asked our men and women to go to war. We didn't ask any American to sacrifice other than our military families, and again, put the whole cost of the war on the credit card. We created a whole new category of spending, Homeland Security. You think it's just a pain in the neck to take your shoes off at the airport. It costs a lot of money. And whether that's Homeland Security, border security, this is, you know, trillion dollars plus of new spending in a whole category of areas that didn't exist pre-9-11. Next item, back in 2004, we, uh, Congress looked around and said, you know, our moms and dads and grandparents, they're spending a lot on prescription drugs, so we created a whole new entitlement program, Medicare Part D. It's been pretty successful. It actually has cost less than we thought, but, but it still adds about net a trillion dollars of cost totally unpaid. And then finally, and I made this point to the, the group over at the Batten School a moment earlier, we're living a lot longer. I'll give the, this group the same quiz that I gave to the Batten School group. We've got a few more adults in here. Maybe they will know. Who set 65 originally as a retirement age? Juan, smart group here. Yes, ma'am. Pardon me? Oh, good job. Nobody gets that. Somebody said Roosevelt. That was way to the normal guess. It's Bismarck. And Bismarck sent 65, set 65 as a retirement age when he was premier of Germany in the 1870s because average life expectancy was mid-50s. Think about it. Perfect politician promise. I'm going to give you a check if you outlive the actuarial tables by seven or eight years. 
You know, that worked then, but now, and this is not a problem, this is a blessing, average life expectancy in America is 100 or 80, and if you're a healthy woman at age 20, many of you students, you're gonna live to 100. That's great. That is something we ought to celebrate. But it means that the math around Medicare, Social Security, and our other programs don't work anymore. Next slide. Um, so what does that mean? It means that if we're going to get this under con this problem under control, anybody that thinks that we can do this by just raising taxes or just cutting spending can't read a balance sheet or doesn't understand the ramifications of this problem. Anybody that says we can do this by just cutting spending and raising taxes and not touching entitlement programs can't read a balance sheet and can't understand the full ramifications of this, uh, of this problem. And this slide is, I think, uh, I don't share it every time, but it's really important because people don't know where our tax dollars go. People generally think, oh, we spend all this money on, you know, education and, and on roads and on energy and poor people programs. Well, that whole category of spending is only 16 cents on every dollar. Look at this, 16 cents on every dollar. Defense at 17 cents. Tax expenditures, why am I putting up here as government spending? Well, the truth is, when we give a tax break in a tax code, that is government spending just by a different name. The irony is the personal income tax in America raises about $1.1 trillion a year. You know how much we spend in tax breaks, tax deductions? About $1.1 trillion a year. So tax expenditures, and you know, everybody says, let's do tax reform. They're all for it until you realize what the big tax expenditures are, charitable deduction, mortgage deduction, you know, state and local taxes deduction, health care exclusion. But tax expenditures are a huge piece of this. Social Security is actually true. It is not part of the debt and deficit. It is a separate account. But don't want to give away a little hidden problem here. There really is no such thing as a Social Security trust fund. It is simply an accounting mechanism. So while Social Security does not directly play into the debt and deficit, one of the reasons we've been able to borrow money at a cheaper rate is because we've been taking all this excess payments out of the Social Security trust fund over the last 30 years, which lower our borrowing costs. Only a little problem happened. Remember my numbers about how many, the aging of our population. We're now paying out more than we're paying in, not because Social Security is not a great program, not because Social Security is not a, a, the most successful social insurance program in American history and in world history, but because demographics. When I was a kid, there were 16 people working for every one person on Social Security and Medicare. Today, there are three people working for every one person on Social Security and Medicare, and by 2025, 2028, it will be two people working for every one person on Social Security and Medicare. My dad's 88 years old, World War II Marine. You know, I've tried to explain this to him. He said, that's my money, that's my Social Security. Don't take it, don't touch it. And I go, Dad, you know, I wanna make sure you get your Social Security forever. But, you know, you got all the money you paid into Social Security out plus interest by about the time you were 72 or 73. Then you've eaten through all the money that my wife and I have paid in, and now you're eating through all the money that my kids have paid in or will pay in over their lifetime. Doesn't mean that it's not a great program, it does mean that some of these things need to change. Other entitlements, this is where like farm subsidies and odds and ends come in. Medicaid, Medicare are the fastest growing parts of our, our, our budget. And interest, that's 6%. If interest rates go to eight or 9%, which they have been much higher than that, you know, that number would almost double. This is just the point again, where we were in terms of just the math around Social Security. Next, here is some of the good news. Um, uh, what have we done? You know, in, in, while Congress and the, and the administration has kind of not been fully successful um, in our efforts, we have made some progress. And the good news is as well, uh, this is not all a grim story, you know, $16.5 trillion in debt. We don't have to solve that all in the next 10 years. You know, we're lucky to be Americans. We're living the world's biggest economy. We have the reserve currency. 
We just have to show the markets and the world that we're going to recognize that this is a real problem and that we're not going to stick you totally with the bill. So what do we need to do? As of 2010, we needed, and this number has probably gone up a little bit, we basically all we need to do is knock about $4 trillion off of that number over the next 10 years. $4 trillion, while sounds a lot, in cuts and in revenue increases on a relative basis to the size of our GDP, it is so much smaller than what's being asked, not only of the people of Greece or Spain or Britain, but of the people of being asked anywhere around the world as we come out of the financial crisis of 2008. It's almost un-American that we haven't shown more will to do it. So what have we done so far? Well, good news, bad news, is we have this uh, is a very busy chart that will hopefully confuse you, but it, 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 what, it, what it basically has said, we have done a series of spending cut restric restrictions. About 90% of those cuts, I should add, are entirely on that slice of the pie that was called the domestic discretionary. So all of the cuts have been education, infrastructure, R&D, you know, early childhood, energy programs. They really haven't been defense or any of the entitlement programs. We've done in total here about about 1.4 to 1.5 trillion dollars in cuts. On New Year's Eve, when we had the you know, last of our iterations of Congress whiffing, you know, we went through the debt ceiling, then we had the super committee, then we had the efforts in the spring, and then we had the fiscal cliff. Um, the, the, what happened on the uh, New Year's Eve was we did raise taxes. We raised taxes on people at the very top. We gained over 10 years again about $600 billion in revenue. The challenge with that is that any of the plans that have been out there, uh, the Simpson-Bowles plan, which maybe some of you have heard about, that uh, uh, was kind of the gold standard or our gang of six. I've been involved in this bipartisan effort that took the Simpson-Bowles and kind of did it Simpson-Bowles 2.0. Just to give you a reference point, we had about, depending on how you cut it, $2 trillion of net new revenue. So the idea that, you know, some of my Republican colleagues that say, well, we've done your revenue, $600 billion. It isn't enough. Now, on the other hand, you know, we haven't touched entitlements yet either, so the Democrats got to give as well. But this shows that the, the gap of what we've got left is roughly about two to two and a half trillion dollars, depending on where you do your cut lines. What's next? Oops. This is the one that you'll have to interpret for yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, um, uh, this is actually, this is a relevant one too. Uh, this one I probably should have put up beforehand. Um, People will say, well, you know, whose fault is it? Can you, you hear the Democrats say, we just can do it by raising revenue. You say the Republicans do it, saying we just by do it by cuts. This shows where our revenue line is now and where our, our, our spending line is. You know, we're now at about 2012, and if we hadn't made some of these adjustments, we would actually be wider. You can see that it is where the dotted line is. The, the red line and the blue line are the actual reality at this point. And the point of this slide is simply this. Remember I said earlier, 75 years of, of, uh, of running deficits, only about five years where we've had a, a um, balanced budget or any kind of surplus. During those five years, when we had a, a budget balance or surplus, Revenues and spending were between 19.5 and 21%. So, again, to the point that says we can do it on one side of the equation as well, only, if we don't get the revenue line up and the spending line down, you're not going to solve this. There is no solution set that says, particularly within the fastest growing group of our American population being folks getting older, there is no way at 18.5% revenue that some folks have suggested, you can never make the budget balance. There's no way you can maintain spending at 23 or 24 percent of GDP and budget, uh, uh, you know, get the, ba the budget anywhere close to, uh, to balance. So it will again require both sides. Okay, this one will be the last slide and uh, just again give you a, a frame of, of where we've been and where we'll, we need to go. You see the original Simpson Bowles and Gang of Six was basically the same as the original Simpson Bowles. The minimum necessary is that red line. You know, if we hadn't done anything, we're at the green line. 
and the current projections are at the blue line. So we have made some progress. We have a gap to go. Uh, but when you think about an additional roughly $2 trillion of cuts in revenues, $2.5 trillion over 10 years, uh, this is, is a challenge that America should be up to. Uh, but what it's going to require, and this is where we'll go to now, now move to questions and why I'm so, so pleased that about the Up to Us campaign, is it's going to require you guys to have your voices heard. Because everybody's for fixing this problem as long as you don't touch mine. Everybody, you know, when we, when we put out a plan, when I put out the Gang of Six, all we heard from were folks that say, don't touch my Medicare, don't raise my taxes. Well, as long as you let politicians lie to you, as long as you let politicians say they can do it on one side only, and you support those kind of politicians, you deserve what you get. Unless we hear from, you, you know, America, who's willing to say, no, this is important, then we are going to be stuck with this issue. Until we are willing as well, and as a point I try to make, which doesn't always make me popular in my Democratic caucus, until we get out of our own personal political foxholes and are willing, regardless of your party, to support people who are willing to find common ground and not, you know, chastise those folks entirely, you're going to get the same kind of politics you've had. The ask I'd make of you, you know, I'm a Democrat. I'm proud to be a Democrat. Um, but the ask I would make of all of you is I could care less which political party you belong to. But I'd say if you're a Democrat in this room, go find a Republican who's willing to be honest about revenues and support them. If you're a Republican, go find a Democrat who's willing to be honest about entitlement reform and support them. Until we can show that kind of, of uh, willingness as Virginians and Americans, then we are not going to solve this problem. And it is imminently solvable. And I personally believe, you know, I'll, I'll close with this before we go to questions. Uh, and I can get into as much specificity on specific ideas on revenues or on entitlement savings as you'd like. Um, I think our economy is poised for a dramatic recovery. You know, our financial system went through some challenging times, but our banking system now is stronger than any other banking system in the world. Our manufacturing sector has remarkably retooled itself, not just our autos, but across the board, just in the last five or six years. Our housing market, which is, normally drives a lot of our economy, is absolutely, the, the pent-up demand in housing is ready to come back. For all our challenges, we have far and away the world's greatest education system, and best and brightest from across the world flock to America, and when we get immigration reform, the ability to have folks then stay here and build their own version of the American dream will add enormous to our economic vitality. Now, the only thing that could hold us back is if our elected leadership doesn't do what's required of them. It's one of the reasons why I think, you know, I said at the beginning, you can't cut and tax your way. You've got to have a growth plan. There will be nothing that would drive more short-term growth and economic vitality than having the knowledge all of us kind of psychically in the business community overall, that there is a real plan in place that's going to bring our debt to GDP ratio back down to a sustainable path. So if you care about education, you care about immigration, you care about whatever issue it is, and I'm sure we'll get into the, the day, this has got to be a passion as well. Because until we get this fixed, my fear is we're not going to get to anything else. And uh, um, what gives me a lot, you know, well, keep me charged and jazzed up for the whole week uh, back in the salt mines when I go back later today is to see all you here today. So with a, a great thanks again to President Sullivan and to all of the young folks from the Up to Us campaign for stepping up and protecting your future. Thank you for coming out today and the floor is now open for questions. Thank you all. <clears throat> You want to come up to the mics, just identify yourself and um, yeah, just give me your name and come on, come on, come on, don't be shy. I'm not going to stand in line at the mics and we'll do it that way, right? Just come on up to the mics and. There's one over here too. I'll go back and forth. So if you don't want to wait in line, you can go over to this one. Um, my name is Tonu. 
Uh, Senator Warren, thank, first of all, thank you for being here and thank you for your service to the state and the Commonwealth and the nation. Um, maybe I'm, uh, I came in a little bit late, but I'm, I might have missed this. We live in, um, as Char Char most of you, I don't know, I live in Charlottesville and we're in the fifth district. How do we persuade Congressman Hart uh, to listen to our voice, I mean, as a, to make the hard compromise necessary? Um, I mean, it seems like there are facts and people see it different ways. And how do we, as citizens? Great, I think great question. And it's, you know, the question was here in Charlottesville with, uh, you know, Congressman Hurt. Um, you know, uh, back when I was governor, um, Democrat, with a, at that point the legislature was two to one, both the House and the Senate. Robert Hurt was one of the members of the House who voted for our our uh, plan that was, you know, Grover Norquist went after him and all these other things. He was, I think, a very courageous guy. Um, and I think there are, you know, I think virtually everyone in the Virginia congressional delegation, you know, they need to hear, they need to hear from you. And at some point, and this will sound trite, but at some point facts really do matter. And, you know, if anything, the 2010 election was a lot about people who were mad, mad at what was going on in Washington, mad at the president. But hiring a bunch of folks that just kind of, you know, obstructed, didn't get things fixed. I actually, I mentioned this at the Batten School. You know, I think 2012 was as much, you know, it wasn't so much just the president winning and, and Democrats having some success. I think it was more, less about Democrats and more about trying to hire people who, they, who were going to be willing to get stuff done. And... Uh, I think, you know, sitting down with the congressman, build your own slide deck and taking it through, uh, you know, in terms of what it happens to the 5th district, um, I wouldn't give up on anybody. But what happens is, I can assure you that people generally don't hear. They hear from folks who are the most ideological on both ends. They don't hear from folks who say, hey, you know, how am I going to pay off this 16, you know, I got enough student loans. I don't need another 16 trillion de in debt on top of that to pay off. Yes, sir. I'll try to be brief or two on the, my answers. My name is Wynn Jordan. I'm a second year, and I'm also from the 5th District of Virginia. Um, I was just wondering, recently we had a uh, big to-do about the Hurricanes uh, or Superstorm Sandy relief bill. And I was just wondering how you determine what is necessary spending great, versus great, what is great, not. Great, great question. Um, I think there's two questions, Wynn, in that. One is, how do you determine what is necessary uh, and there is a procedure that FEMA and the governors, you know, they put in requests, they're normally sliced back down um, to figure out what is the real necessary amount. And, you know, that raises a host of other questions like, you know, at what level should we be constantly replenishing areas that are on beaches, uh, you know, which... So, you know, which you may say as the 5th District, I want to do that, but, you know, we, we replenish the beach in Virginia Beach, you know, 23 of the last 40 years, you know, each year. So there is some of that determination. Then there's also the determination that on, 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 uh, you know, on catastrophes, do you do that on budget or off budget? What has traditionally been the case has been that we do them kind of off budget, which when you hit the Sandys and the Katrinas kind of blow a hole. So one of the things that we thought about was kind of building into your budget baseline a 10-year running average so that you, you know, you've got that contingency account there so that it doesn't blow out the budget. So you can't fully predict, and obviously if you have a great tragedy, one of the reasons why a country is, is to come in and help other states, and you know, it's the Northeast one time, and it's the Midwest another, so we all get back some of this at some point, but there ought to be a way that part of that can be budgeted on a going forward basis. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Laura Blessing, and I'm finishing my dissertation on tax policy in the Department of Politics here. And my question is that, <laughs> why I'm hanging out with you guys today. <laughs> um, my question is that a lot of these high stakes deadlines, uh, sequestration, fiscal cliff, et cetera, come from the debt ceiling uh, snafu in August 2011, and specifically the insistence by uh, Standard & Poor's and other agencies, other ratings, credit ratings agencies, uh, that we do something long-term to deal with our debt. 
Um, this seems to be a policy setting aspect to credit agencies, which is perhaps unwise. To what extent is there any plan to investigate uh, credit agencies and the influence that they have over all our politics? Thank you. Oh, well, good question. I mean, and you know, and I do think the credit agencies back during the housing crisis muff things amazingly. And actually, the, I think the Justice Department recently just is going to bring a suit against Standard & Poor's. Um, but I don't think the idea that you're going to get rid of the credit agencies, it makes sense. And you do need some guidepost. I mean, right now, people are out there, uh, just to give, this gets into kind of a technical thing, but you know, the way, and this kind of is technical and accounting, but in many of the European countries, their bank debt counts as a liability. Their sovereign debt doesn't. Well, I got to tell you, I would probably take, you know, the bank debt of UBS over the bank debt of the Greek government. So you've got to have some markers out there, and if there are ways to improve the credit agencies, yes, but there's got to be some, some criteria. The point that I would also make, though, is um, the budget process and the appropriations process and all those ought to be the place we fight. I think, you know, I was very much for the President Obama being reelected. Um, the one thing that would have been maybe good if Romney had been reelected, we might, might have gotten rid of this debt ceiling debacle. The idea that whichever party is going to use the debt ceiling to put in the full faith and credit of the United States government at risk every 12 or 18 months is a stupid way to run a government. Yes, sir. Yes, so I'm one of the uh, Up to Us team members. Yep. And on our website, which is casa.com slash UVA up to us. Um, you all get that? We're out there. Can we put that up on a slide? <laughs> we uh, had people submit questions. And so we have four questions here for you. OK. Answer. <laughs> However you want. Yes. <laughs> no. Maybe. Um, <laughs> OK. Why is it so hard to cut defense spending? Um, Three reasons. One, you know, the most critical role of any national government is to provide for the national defense. Two, the defense contractors are really smart about spreading the business all over 50 states. <laughs> Three, you know, defense industry employs a lot of people. But you know, what I go back to on defense spending, and Virginia is the highest per capita defense spending state in the country. And we're already seeing effects of sequestration, you know, which are these automatic cuts, which were set up to be the stupidest possible cuts. Possible. Do you ever, anybody ever remember the movie Blazing Saddles? You all old enough for that? <laughs> remember the scene where the sheriff comes out with a gun and almost blows his head off? That's kind of what Congress does with sequestration, and we're about to blow our heads off. It was set up to be so stupid that no rational people would ever agree to it. So, you know, for example, if, if you really want to get upset, I don't want to just go on too much on this one, but it really is important why we have to avoid sequestration, which is, you know, there are 975 separate line items in the Navy budget. One year a ship may be out to sea, the next year it's back in dry dock. It doesn't cost the same amount. It could cost, you know, 10 million one year and 500 million the next year. If you have to cut each program, regardless of its value, equal amounts, you're going to lose money in many ways. So, give you two examples. For example, when we buy aircraft carriers, guns, tanks, ships, if you buy more than one, by law you've got to get a 10% discount. Well, if we do absolute sequestration and can't honor those contracts, we will break these multi-purchase contracts of armaments that will end up costing us more money than we save. You know, I'll give you one example. Virginia-class submarines, they cost $2.5 billion if you buy them individually. They cost $2 billion if you buy more than two at once, we put a contract in for three. If we have to break those contracts, the taxpayer loses $500 billion. Or, on a non-defense side, National Institute of Health research projects, you might have five years of a research grant, four years done, if you can't let the fifth year because you have to cut the contract and you have no flexibility, you flush the research for the first four years. So, you know, that's a little off defense, but it is directly related to this. It has to be part of the mix. And one of the reasons that um, it is, uh, this is a national security issue. Admiral Mullins, the, chairman of the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the biggest threat to our national security isn't the terrorists, it's the debt and deficit. So it has to be part of the mix. I will answer these others in writing to you because I want to make sure I get to all these other folks. All right? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ishan, and I was just asking, I'm wondering, do you believe if cutting the 
private sector debt, the state and local government debt, and the federal budget debt, all at the same time could end the recovery and keep unemployed people who've been out of the labor force for years out for good? If we cut them all at once, yes. So what we did on the you know, Simpson Bowles and Gang of Six plan, all these cut numbers and some of these revenue raising numbers, because it's both cuts and revenue raising, you've got to do them, you've got to phase them in as the recovery recovers. So that next two and a half trillion dollars, you know, so a lot of that you wouldn't have start until next year. You would start certain areas and ramp it rather than do it pro rata going forward. Um, and let me just, I want to mention one thing on the revenue side. I'm a, a big believer on the progressive tax system. You know, uh, I've done very well. I should be paying more uh, than um, uh, somebody who's starting out. But if we're going to raise the revenues <clears throat> that we need, we're going to have to raise them from more than just the top 1% or 2%. You know, one of the ideas that I'm going to lay out at some point in more detail uh, than here is a debt reduction surcharge that would ramp up for everybody, start at a very meager amount, quarter of 1%, ramp up to maybe 1% or 2%, you know, and attack all income, so capital gains as well as ordinary income, and have that to be a dedicated debt reduction surcharge that would go to a separate account, and we could, I think, start to change the frame of this debate from a us versus them populism debate around revenues to the notion of a war bond campaign, where every American is going to do at least some small part to help pay this down. This, I think the country is desperately looking for a, a, uh, a rallying point, and I think this issue could be one of them. Yes, sir, I was told uh, to give yes, shorter sir. answers. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Tom Bunting. I'm a third year uh, transit student, actually. And what you just said, actually, is a transition to my question. I was, we keep hearing continuously how we're going to responsibly cut spending and raise, ta well, from the Democrats, anyway, how we're going to responsibly raise taxes and cut spending. But how can we have, and a growth agenda, excuse me, how can we have a specific plan? Because all we keep hearing is just those three items. But how can we, can we actually get a plan, if as you just said, from taxes, but some more concrete? Sure. I, I am, um, you know, the Gang of Six plan or Simpson Bowles, which are basically the same. We went into specific health care policy changes. We went into specific revenue things. You know, a little bit of our revenue didn't have the tax, you know, the debt reduction surcharge. We did it more kind of around tax reform, which is a little squishy because, you know, everybody's for it in the abstract. The reality is a, a, a lot tougher. Uh, I think there will be uh, another, you know, the president has laid out without a lot of fanfare a proposal that, you know, has $400 billion in health care cuts, raises about $600 billion from tax reform, you know, does things like what's called the chain CPI, which is a different way of measuring consumer price that raises some revenues and cuts. So there is specificity out there. I, one of the things I think your critique is valid, though, and I wish the president would take his plan and, and kind of highlight it again to say, here ought to be at least a point. Um, and I think one of the things we're thinking about is whether we would lay out, again, another bipartisan option. Uh, we were we had hoped at one of my disappointment points uh, was after the election, um, those of us who had been working on this had, had thought we would, might be a good idea to lay out our plan and let the president and the speaker like shoot at it, but it would, might have shortened the kabuki dance, you know, to the kind of um, stepchild program we got on, on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, but it was amazing. Neither the Republicans nor the administration wanted to have a bipartisan plan out there at that point. Frustrating job. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator, for laying out the overall projects, the overall issues with the debt ceiling um, and the deficit. Uh, a local man, or excuse me, a Virginia man who has written about this extensively, especially as how it affects young people in Virginia, is Jim Bacon. And he's got a book, unfortunately I cannot remember the name, which goes through exactly how it will affect the young folks into the future. If anybody would like to find that book, you can find it. Jim Bacon is the author's name, mm -hmm. and it's on Bacon's Rebellion. Right. Dot org. Um, in addition, one of the things that Mr. Bacon and anybody who, th who thinks about this talks about is a local project. We have right here in Charlottesville, Nalmar County, the projected spending of $240 million to build a highway, which will do nothing for us locally and only create, according to Mr. Bacon's, the only return on investment. Uh, study of it will only return to the citizens of Virginia $8 million in benefits. This is a project that no rational businessman 
would potentially build. So, but most folks in America, or most folks in Virginia and Albemarle County think this is a done deal. How does one go about stopping the spending of money that seemingly is in the pipeline, even though people, very conservative people like Jim Rich, or the taxpayers of common sense, call one of the eight worst transportation projects in the nation? How do we stop this? Well, stupidity? let me um, just, uh, and this is not totally playing to the crowd, but uh, I'll just uh, remind the audience that I was a member of the Commonwealth Transportation Board in 1991 and voted against the Charlottesville bypass because I thought it was too close. It wasn't a broad enough bypass that thought far enough away. You know, the fact that it's not been built still shows that there are still challenges with the pr program. But it, you know, it, it, it go and goes back to citizen involvement. You know, let me let me also then take one other piece of this that affects you all. That that is uh, about the growth piece of this. You know, we have to both root out where we're spending that is unnecessary, and that is you know somewhat in the eye of the beholder. Let me acknowledge that. But those are healthy debates. Those are valid debates. But we also have to have a kind of a macro plan around growth again. My biggest critique, for example, of of Paul Ryan's budget that came out was not some of his entitlement reforms. I don't agree with his approach, but I do think I give him credit for laying out some ideas with some specificity on entitlements. But what blew my mind on his, on his business plan was he would cut that non-defense domestic discretionary spending, which is education, infrastructure of all kinds, research and development, which if you think as a business investor, I used to invest in work, you know, the management team, their plant and equipment, how to stay ahead of the competition. Those are the governmental equivalents to less than 5% of federal spending. No other industrial country in the world is gonna spend less than 5% of their tax revenues on educating their workforce, building their infrastructure, and staying ahead of the competition. Mitt Romney would have never invested in that plan at Bain Capital. And we have to have, you know, we have to be prudent on where we invest, but we also have to recognize, I at least personally believe, and you may disagree, that around education, infrastructure, and R&D, those are areas that public investment is not gonna be supplanted by private. It's gonna be part of our obligation. Yes, sir. Hey, my name is Keenan. Um, I'm a third. So much for my short answer. I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, like you said in your presentation, um, um, for the most part, people aren't aware of where their tax dollars are going. Uh, this is particularly concerning to me in the terms of uh, global health spending, uh, spending rather, uh, where less than one percent of our budget is spent on programs like the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. So. Um, so I'm, so I'm concerned about how public perception and public misunderstanding will affect sort of uh, our aid to the world. Would you agree that yeah. it's an important issue to continue funding and sort of how that perception affects? That's a great, boy, oh boy. The question was, you know, America's role in the rest of the world when we think about aid, you know, foreign aid, AIDS funding, other kind of hunger funding and other things else. Um, I think it is a is a um, is an critically important part of our, our national security program. Um, I don't think people realize there are more members of military marching bands than there are State Department officials posted abroad. Little fun factoid, uh, and uh, one of the things that we need to think about is, in one, how we get good value for those dollars, but two, if we can. America can have a positive influence in a country that's a heck of a lot cheaper than sending in a whole military establishment. Doesn't mean it's one or the other, but increasingly what has happened is the military, as it's taken on more and more a role of post-conflict resolution in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, has started to think through, you know, you can't just do this as soldiers, you need to do it with aid, but this has not been really, this is a policy debate that is, I think, at its beginnings. What we've got to do in the meantime is not have you know, the very tiny percent. People disproportionately think that, oh my gosh, if we just cut off foreign aid, uh, that would you know, get rid of this whole problem. It is you know, less than like half of 1% of our spending is related to foreign aid. So again, facts at some point matter. But this debate needs to be, I hope to be part of it going forward. Great question. Yes, please. Thanks for being here. My name is David. i um, sort of a history buff. And uh, what I see going on up in Washington is a, a lack of, a great lack of common sense. And I'm a bottom line kind of guy. I've come to the realization that the reason that's happening up there is because of money and politics. 
And uh, until we get money out of politics, you know, we, we basically don't have, in my mind, a, a, a real democracy going here. This is a plutocracy where corporations and banks with lots of money buy influence up in Washington. They call the shots. And, uh, and we have to deal with whatever uh, the scraps me, are. Yeah. Let me try to address that. Uh, let, me, right. let, me, let me, Neil Borofsky, who is the ex-SIG TARP, the Special Inspector General for TARP, uh, oversees the money for, for TARP. I just saw him on Jon Stewart recently. You guys watch Jon Stewart. And he basically says, you know, we're in the same situation. The banks that got us into this mess are doing exactly the same thing that they were doing when he was SIGTARP. And un until we get money out of politics, this is going to continue ad infinitum, is the bottom line. I have spent myself, I've had an issue. Okay, I've spent let me just four years on. Let me just hundreds of hours. Respectfully, we got a lot of the folks. Go right ahead. Let me just, just quickly say money in politics. Yeah. Who'd like to see it out? I would. Or cut back dramatically. I don't think you're going to get rid of it entirely, but, but Citizens United was a bad decision. Exactly. We needed to end up, you know, and, and this works on both sides. I mean, Citizens United, I think, needs to be changed. I think we needed to at least have disclosure. We couldn't even get a bill through for disclosure to make sure that if you're going to put these unlimited amounts of money in. You know, my hope, the only kind of practical hope short of changing the law or the Supreme Court on this point is that um, there were an awful lot of money that was pissed away this last, uh, last election cycle. So hopefully some of those folks will think twice next time. Please. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Connor. I'm a fourth year. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about to what extent is budget, actual budget balance a goal? And if you could get a little bit into the details of the four and a half trillion number that you came up with, um, I'd appreciate that. All right, sure. It, two points on this. Um, <clears throat> four and a half trillion is an, you know, these are all 10 year projections. So it's a bit of an estimation of what it will take to really start that curve from going up to coming down and drive it back towards the, you know, 70% of GDP level, back to that first slide, okay? Is it an exact number? No. Why four and a half trillion? Because it was four trillion in 2010. The, the, the deficit keeps going up, so this is a rough estimate. So it, it, it is nothing more than that. Second, one of the things that people raise, and this was not part of your question, but it's asked, which is people say, well, hold it, you say you're cutting but your top line number is still going up. So is that really a cut since you're just decreasing the increase? And my point back is, you know, I believe it still is a cut because if you, you know, if you, if you are paying $100 for 100 people to give them some whatever service, and next year you've got 110 people and you're only spending $105, is that a cut or not a cut? In Washington, that would be viewed as a cut because your per capita is actually gone down. It's a semantics and accounting argument, but it is part of the thing that, you know, we don't have to solve it, but the four to four and a half trillion is the, you know, across the board, left to right economists say, is basically the range of what we've need, and we've basically done about two trillion. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And sir. thank you all for hanging. I know you've got, you know, lunch and studies and everything, but the fact that you all have hung in this long on this subject, <laughs> you know, if I was still governor, I'd like, even you know, when I was governor and this, if I was doing this at VMI, I could have gotten rid of all of your demerits. I don't know if I can like, you know, I don't know what I, what, anything I can do here as senator, I don't know, not as many perks to give out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Senator Warner. Um, my question was regarding um, kind of what you shared with us today concerning um, our national debt and how that relates to education. Um, with the significant increase in the amount of access to student loans, you have families like, like the family that I'm a part of where we've accumulated a huge amount of debt and there doesn't seem to be a huge um, possibility of being able to pay those off at any time in the right. near future. And so with this inflation and in access to loans and just the ease of being able to just take out money to pay for your education, do you think that this is going to inevitably lead away to another kind of crash? Man, great question. And um, short answer is yes, the student loan crisis won't be as bad as the housing bubble crisis, but it's coming. Two, you know, Pell Grants are great, uh, but student debt is driving people to not being able to make choices 
that you should be able to make coming out of college, although I say this as somebody without a student loan program, first in my family to graduate from college, you know, I wouldn't have been able to have, do it without it. And I do think, and I say this, with, I know President Sullivan's not here right now, um, uh, but I think we're, the whole fundamental idea of how we fund higher education is going to be increasingly a challenge. You know, UVA luckily has an ability to do things that you know, other schools can't do. You know, Radford or you know, JMU or others don't have near the kind of, of um, you know, foundation and other private funding to support folks. So we are pricing education high, further and further away. I think we need to be radical. I think we need to think about whether we need a four-year curriculum. I think we need to think about things like, Gary, I, I, talk, I had a program to try to get you at least a half semester of credit in high school through dual enrollment or AP that would actually count towards your major, not just electives. I think the idea that Certain, st I think you're going to may see at some point states go where everybody starts the first year or so at a community college. Uh, but that's part of an education debate. But I think you've you've touched something that is is the student loan issue is one that is, um, and it's masked because the, the the great schools have additional resources to kind of help folks in the margin. You know, and, and, and disproportionately, it is becoming really the middle class kids who are getting hit the worst. Great to see you. Good afternoon. Ann Malik for Admiral County. I know you. And I urge you to hurry because local governments are at the end of the line and the buck truly does stop with us. So as you make cuts, you pass it to Richmond, Richmond takes their share or often more than their share before they send it to local governments. The uncertainty of what's coming our way is making it difficult for us to have the courage to invest in the kinds of job creating infrastructure projects locally because we don't know if we'll have the cash to pay the debt pay the loan. So please hurry. Thank you. Amen, Ann. You know, this is again, we don't every, oh, I forgot to give you the other really depressing factoid since you guys stayed so late. I feel like bad to bum you out this way. You know, tonight, tomorrow morning when you wake up, uh, that seven, sixteen and a half trillion dollar number goes up by three billion dollars every 24 hours. You know, and you guys are paying. Uh, it goes again to the idea that when we continue to punt on this question, we do such a disservice, not just at the federal level, but all across. Let's go ahead and lay out the medicine, tell the truth, phase it in, and then people can plan against it. I mean, with these sequestration cuts and so forth, I know I'm giving the hook. Uh, but, you know, you can plan against anything, you just can't plan against uncertainty. I'm going to take two last questions and then one each. Hey. Yeah, you're still staff. <laughs> uh, Teddy Lombardi from Darden. Um, just with the, with the wings of both parties kind of growing in the middle to the moderates like yourself getting thinned out, do you see a catalyst that brings us back where there are more moderates and there is more aisle crossing? And if so, what is, what is that? <sighs> great, great question. Um, You know, um, the thing I'm worried about is whether as many kind of talented and good folks want to go into this anymore. You know, I, I am incredibly fortunate. You know, I said to the earlier group, I mean, I can do this on terms very few people can. I, you know, I made my money first. I had a good run as governor. I just get to sleep in my own bed each night. I, mean, I think about these poor guys and gals who, you know, 11 or 12 hours, they slept back every weekend to some place. I don't know anybody. I was a business guy for a long time. I don't know any business guy who doesn't say, oh, Mark, thank goodness you're doing it. I wouldn't do that for a million years. So this whole notion of public service being a noble calling and a noble profession and a valuable pr profession is, is, is sliding. And, you know, when it's great to have Congress be the brunt of every joke, but you know, it is not healthy for America and our democracy when Congress has 7% approval ratings. When the Communist Party of the United States of America is more popular than con Congress in the last survey. So you know, what I hope and pray is that you know, this, this issue, which I think has again become a bit of a metaphor for whether our institutions work, we can get it right. Uh, because I think it's a lot more than dollar signs and specific programs on reinforcing that idea that there is a willingness to find common ground, there is a willingness to get stuff done. And I just 
got to believe. I mean, it keeps, the only thing that keeps me going is that if we break the dam on this, you know, that then the ability to find that same common ground on immigration, on gun control, on uh, education reform, energy, you know, will come about. But it will require, at the end of the day as well, not only everybody getting out, as I mentioned earlier, your personal political foxhole, but it will require you guys being involved. This is too important just to leave to the politicians. This is too important to leave to the organized interest groups in Washington that make their living not on stuff getting done, but on continuing conflict. And as Dave mentioned about money, you know, a lot of that is due to the fact that those interest groups are funded by folks who don't want to see solutions. And, you know, it's every bit as much your kind. Matter of fact, you've got a lot longer life in front of you than I do. And, you know, this, is your, this needs to be your fight. That's, again, why the up to us crowd, I can't imagine, you know, if you were part of the founders of the up to us going on a dorm hall and saying, hey, let's get jazzed up about the debt. <laughs> you know, what, you, what your other students must have looked at you at. But, you know, God bless you for doing it. You got the last word. <laughs> last word. You've mentioned today, uh, you've kind of used a shorthand for sustainability as uh, our debt as a percentage of the GDP at $16.5 trillion. I looked at our financial statements and it says we've also got another unfunded amount, the difference in social security programs, income, and outgo of $38.5 trillion. If I use that number and add it to the debt, it, it changes the urgency of where we stand right now uh, dramatically. I know that number is kind of loose, but could you address whether that's a real number and whether it's really part of the calculation in a real world environment, oh. not just an accounting? That's a much longer answer. And it, it, we could even make it worse because if you start to take state and local ten pension fund obligations that are mostly all off balance sheet as well, you, know, you can get to this crushing, go hide in the corner and bury your head. Um, you know, there is a little bit of leap of faith here. Yes, these obligations are huge. But, for example, change CPI, the changing of the consumer price index measuring, which would slightly lower the rate of increase from, say, if your COLA increase was 36 bucks a month, it would move it to 33 bucks a month. It would, you know, it would take 22% of the outstanding liabilities of Social Security off the books. Just that little tiny change. You know, putting in some means testing or adding a year for people in 35. You know, we can, these are imminently fixable things. Um, so, yeah, you can get bummed on this stuff. But what as America has always done is, you know, stepped up to challenges. So I don't think these financial challenges, you know, can, can, um, they shouldn't be underestimated, but they shouldn't be overestimated. Uh, I'll, I'll just close with this. And, you know, in the late 80s, everybody was about to write off America. You know, they said our manufacturing sector was dead. Um, we had this, you know, debt that was going to crush us. And there was this emerging Asian nation that was going to bury America. At that point, it was Japan. We hit the 90s, and, you know, Clinton did a debt deal or budget deal that brought us back to some stability, you know, our manufacturing sector recovered, and we never could factor in the innovation that came out of things like the wireless industry and the internet and others that drove American growth at numbers that were just outrageous. I think we're poised to do that again. So I'm not giving you the specificity you want because I could really bum me out. <laughs> uh, you know, let's get the 16 and a half trillion under control, let's drive that down to a doable way, in a way that, that uh, uh, is reasonable, in a way that everybody feels like they got some skin in the game. You know, the thing around this issue that is, uh, is so important is that, um, you know, I think most Americans, regardless of where you fall in the political, they want to be Americans first. And a lot of our political system now reinforces you to be a Democrat or Republican first, especially up in Congress these days. And this issue, because it is so broad, so comprehensive, touches everything that government does in some way or the other. Nobody's talking about a great expansion of government at this point. I mean, we've already had that debate of, on health care. But, you know, we're talking about just paying our bills, which is kind of at the core is what we all grew up with. That could, this could be that issue that, that 
lights that spark that not only tries to, doesn't get it all fixed, but gets us back on the right path and I think sets the economy back forward. Uh, I'll answer this gentleman individually in a minute because I, I gotta, they've given me the hook. I'll come and see you individually, all right? Uh, but I wanna again thank the university. I wanna thank President Sullivan. I wanna thank everybody from uh, the kid, the students from up to us. Uh, and it is up to you. So uh, get it done. I'll close with this the same way I closed in, in the other room. Um, there are moments when you get bummed out in this and I get bummed out there are days I feel like I'm banging my head. Um, I always go back at the moments of most despair to Winston Churchill, one of my personal heroes. World War II, he's Prime Minister of England. The Nazis have taken over all of Europe. There's a question about, you know, whether England will be able to survive. He spoke up instead to Parliament when the question of whether America, what they would do. You can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> well, we've tried everything else. It's time for all of us to do the right thing. Thank you all very much.